Thank you. You'll forgive me if I speed through this because I had to do some serious chopping to fit within the time frame. I'm going to take you on a journey. 14th of November 2017, empty hearth. What is it worth, they make you ask. What's it worth? They ask, but they don't want to know. They ask, but its measure of worth is an alien yardstick. They ask, but they ask the wrong person. The one they ask, the only one they should ask, can't name her price, the price of betrayal. You can't buy her love, you just can't. Every home tells a story and every story has a home. This story is currently unfolding in inner city East Brisbane, where my parents have lived for 33 years and within their community. Losing your home to compulsory acquisition is even more personal than losing your home. It is communal and it has broad reach. The non-resumed residents who live in East Brisbane fighting to be heard alongside their resumed neighbours are also suffering the loss of their reshaped home. The visual and physical and emotional amenity and livability. It is not without good reason that we talk about country and homeland as expressions of our intrinsic communal connection. Mowbray Park is an asset of community and heritage significance in East Brisbane. When such sources of local community pride are attacked without community accountability by political leaders, mutual respect and trust are damaged. In personal context, these values are critical, but in public office, where people's lives, physical and mental well-being and livelihoods are at stake, they are non-negotiable. I'd like to quote the sentiment of one local community member. I have lived in this area since 1968. My dad bought the house in La Trobe Street in 1973. I have seen many changes since I was a child, but the enduring thing about East Brisbane is its sense of community. Besides our beautiful Mowbray Park and what is left of our lovely old homes, it is why I still live here. The operative words are intertwining connection, local, and importantly, home. The local homes, their streetscapes, neighbours, Mowbray Park with its majestic mature figs and communal amenity, its war memorial, all these fall within the definition of what this community cherishes. Importantly, connections through time, through the generations, through the local and family narrative. My own children, nieces, nephews, siblings and parents have enjoyed many a family celebration and recreational gathering in this much loved green haven. These are the joys of authentic communal gathering spaces that promote well-being. This is very important for an understanding of the depth of emotion and opposition surrounding the community's current and impending losses in the Lytton Road is White Enough campaign. The very values publicly proclaimed by all our authorities of respect, of integrity, of public accountability were being denied to us as a matter of course and natural justice, supposedly for the greater good. There is something deeply patronising in this approach to community. I have repeatedly encountered stories similar trauma to that of my families that I didn't go looking for. Allow me to share with you a quote from Martin Luther King who said, we need, we need leaders not in love with money but in love with justice, not in love with publicity but in love with humanity. Leaders who are not committed to justice and humanity are not committed, in my view, to community, and they will be unable to fulfil their moral obligation to all the people they serve, not just those whose political or financial persuasion they happen to share. If we accept the premise that the right to speak and the right to be heard are basic human needs dictated by respect, it can safely be assumed that community well-being will flow from processes that are fair, respectful, timely, collaborative and accountable. It can also be safely claimed that the opposite is true, namely, of being heard. Stonewalling, social and community dismembering, bullying, secrecy, lack of accountability and political ping-pong that many of us have experienced might all fall within the realm of behaviours that are not only not helpful but can be defined as abuse. Community abuse and abuse of power. In the case of Luton Road, by pronouncing the project a done deal before it even began in 2014, a whole community was betrayed and left disempowered, 
deep trauma for those residents who had bought their properties in good faith, having done their due diligence and fully aware of what they'd bought into. The potential of perhaps losing a few metres of road of their property at the front, but being able to still keep their homes, to stay in their homes, people like my elderly parents. Some residents had already set their properties back some years ago in preparation for such an eventuality. Their efforts and their costs now rendered futile. There are many ways in which my own health has suffered as I've walked this tightrope as cold advocate and process mediator for my Greek parents and the author of their objection document, a veritable thesis of 55,000 words. On the other hand, I knew that all the power for this process lay within the hands of the veto authority. Its use of the law to bulldoze its way through residents' rights by proclaiming its done deal nature was apparently from the start there, but the law was definitely, deafeningly silent. No distress, it claims, and still claims, in Queensland. Consultative and explanatory tokenism, stonewalling, obstruction to information, untimeliness, misinformation, using the law to justify coercion, contractor insensitivity, time frame abuse, perceived integrity challenges within the valuation process leading to financial loss for people like my parents, and possibly the most difficult to swallow of all, the patronising and authoritarian behaviour in response to the emotional pain by those you approached. It took two years for the public documents relating to this particular project to be released into the public. Two years. Only after the community's outcry and objection period had already expired for those people who had supposedly voluntarily surrendered their hopes, their homes in despair. Would it surprise you at this point to know that community objection ranked very high as a high risk factor in the, docu in the, in the council's own um, business case? My parents did find a home eventually under extreme duress and tension within the family after several false starts, but they're having to relocate twice with their belongings in storage, though their rent is admittedly being paid for. We're unsure if the more mature plants transplanted from my father's beloved garden for his new home will survive now. There is almost no financial rigour room because of their compensation for needed renovations. The new home is high set, two sets of stairs, we know what that means for elderly people. Low set homes are rare as hen's teeth in inner city Brisbane because of property values. Though we have applied and been granted funds to build a mobility access ramp, this is an undertaking for the whole family that has added to our emotional burden. Renovations are anything but fun. You will know what I mean. Mum and Dad are fiercely proud and even talk of a ramp that was, was met with staunch refusal because somehow it implied that they were uh, incapacitated. They've been able to live extremely independently up to this point. Though closer to my own home, in fact the house their new home will be, and to the shopping centre that is already familiar to them, their new home has previously been flooded. Well, so now they're up for triple the home insurance. They've been forced out of their suburb, away from their local doctors and community, and they continue to live with the trauma and injustice of the last three years. This is my parents' beautiful home and garden, iconic Guandalan, now surrounded by scaffolding and soon to be crushed to rubble. In the 21st century, authenticity and integrity of process demand new higher norms if community mental health is indeed a priority. These norms must be embedded into law at every government level if we are serious about addressing the present and future suffering exacted against the elderly and all those living in communities being shaped beyond recognition and voice at alarming rates. And our acquisition laws are no exemption. There must be an imperative to inform and justify political decision making based on global evidence before projects are enacted so that human viability is not compromised for the sake of economic sustainability or profitability. Our collective integrity is at stake. There must be follow up to gauge the physical and mental health impact of compulsory acquisition and in Queensland the law must be reviewed urgently and changed to validate emotional distress and deal with the present loopholes that are harming those they purport to protect enabling manipulation and exploitation at severe cost to individuals and local communities so that government can fit in with their budget. A community divided and conquered and Lytton Road is sadly not unique here, is by definition destabilised and traumatised. And in its midst, elderly residents, young families, families dealing with chronic illness and disability. These were the traumatic scenes on my parents' doorstep on a daily basis recently. 
the emotional carnage deeply confronting. The message they conveyed was, this is no longer your neighbourhood, and soon this will no longer be your home, while they were still living there. It provoked chronic anxiety, nightmares, conflict, insomnia, despair and more about the present, about the future, about the irrevocable financial losses and health impacts endured, but especially about the true meaning of justice, or rather of its absence. It has left my father the more frail and with a bitter aftertaste of the meaning of a weakened democracy. So is there in fact a hierarchy of needs, or does this situation arise by default that those with the most political clout and the most access to legal and financial resources are able to stake their claim ahead of everyone else for the greater good? Does mental health of the elderly and those most vulnerable and within the community really matter when it comes to compulsory acquisition? One non-resumed resident of Lytton Road notes, my neighbours are breaking their lease because their six-month-old baby has developed an asthmatic cough. The noise over the past few weeks has been unbearable, with large demolition excavators using jackhammers six days a week from seven in the morning. Luckily, I can get some relief when I go to work, but I feel for the elderly that are in their homes and have to endure this all day. As someone of Greek heritage, cultural understanding of home must be brought to bear in the acquisition process with its inherent potential to create social and community alienation. Relocating at any age is challenging, but relocating for the elderly is fraught. I'm not here to downplay the pressures and stresses triggered by a common congestion woes, but to affirm unequivocally that nothing is more important than a single human life. To assert otherwise is to deny our creative capacity to problem solve, to deny our collective humanity, and to create a traumatic ripple effect within community that in the end harms us all. This is my mum. She says, Andios pitakimu, farewell my little home. Signomi pusafino, I'm sorry to be leaving you. Mepoli agapi, with much love. Theano Micheli. Thank you.